We're trying to understand what are all possible finite abelian groups out there in the universe. What do they look like? How can we classify them? And the two processes that we most need to be able to do in order to succeed at that classification task are, first of all, to be able to take two groups that we understand and piece them together into a larger group that has a more intricate structure. That's the product construction. But this week, we want to turn to the opposite process, which is to take a group that we might not know very much about, which could be kind of large and complicated, and understand how to break it apart. In what ways is the larger group built out of smaller constituent subgroups on the inside of it? So whereas last week we talked about products as a way of taking two groups that might be relatively easily understood, like the Klein 4 group and the, the Z mod 3, the group of order 3, and taking those groups and piecing them together to form a larger group in a product construction. One way of doing that is just to form the, the external direct product of those two groups, in which case, for example, if my original groups were abelian, then the external direct product will also be abelian. So clearly the external direct product is going to play a pretty important role if we're going to understand how finite abelian groups work. But the external direct product is not the only kind of product construction that can turn two smaller groups into a larger one. There's also what we call the semi-direct products which is a way of taking two groups and intertwining their operations one with another in a systematic fashion in a way that can make an even more interesting structure on the, the products of elements here than we had in the original groups. For example, there's a semi-direct product of Z2 direct product Z2 with Z3 that makes a group that's isomorphic to A4, which is not even abelian. So semi-direct product can be a way of making some non-abelian structures even out of abelian pieces. So products give us a way of piecing together groups into larger structures. We want now to turn our attention to the opposite. How do I break apart a group into its constituent pieces? For example, here's a group that we call the quaternion group of order 8. It consists of 1 and negative 1 with the usual arithmetic uh, via multiplication that we would think of, and then 3 what we might call imaginary units, i, j, and k, each of them whose square is equal to negative 1, and therefore also has its opposite. So this is a group under multiplication. And if I take a look at the subgroup, which consists of the real numbers 1 and minus 1 inside of this group, then the question I want to ask is, in what way is the larger group built atop the smaller subgroup? The smaller subgroup here being isomorphic to Z mod 2. So we want to understand not how to form a product, but how to form a quotient. How to pull apart a group along lines that can then be reconstructed using a product. Basically, how do we undo a product construction to discover the constituent pieces that could make up this group if we were to take a product of them again. For example, if we're convinced that 1 and minus 1 form a subgroup here of this group of order 8, then would maybe 1, i, j, and k, would maybe the columns of this little times table that we have going on here, would those form a group in some way that's systematic that we could understand? Um, do 1, i, j, and k maybe relate in some way to some group of order 4 that we could understand? that then we should be able to piece back together in order to form the larger group. So one of the nice things about this particular group of order 8 here is that it has a nice internal structure to it, the way that I've arranged the elements into rows and columns. My subgroup here on the first row and this other group here coming down the first column have this property that if I multiply an element of the first row by an element from the first column, the resulting product is actually on that row and that column in my times table. So this group, I've been, able, I've been able to arrange the elements in this group in a way that forms its own times table, in a way. And that would seem to be an important construction, that if we can somehow arrange the elements of our group in a way that they form their own nice internal times table, that's a way of really understanding what product structure might exist inside of that group, along which lines we can then pull apart to discover the factors which made up that product. And if the fates are kind, We'll then be able to recognize the rows of this times table as nothing more than the cosets of that subgroup which we identified as being the first row. So the best way to understand an internal structure inside of a group that we're going to have is to be able to identify a subgroup and then be able to identify every other element as cosets of that subgroup in a way in which the cosets themselves will be able to be associated with a group in and of their own right. So the big question of this week is when do the cosets of a subgroup form a group themselves? Because when they do, that group is going to give us the missing factor 
in the product that will then allow us to piece the big group back together from the original subgroup and the new group which we get by the cosets of that subgroup. For example, this coset here that contains the element i and this coset that contains the element j. When I multiply i times j in the quaternion group of order 8, the product is equal to k. And we notice that that's true not just for the elements i, j, and k, but also for any elements in their coset. Minus i times minus j is actually going to give me k. i times minus j is going to give me minus k. Anything from this row multiplied by anything from that row is guaranteed to give me something from this row. And that's the way in which we're going to say these cosets are going to act like a group. But the cosets of a subgroup cannot act like a group unless that subgroup has a particular property that becomes super important this week, a property that we call normality. So if we want our cosets to behave like a group in their own right, we need our original subgroup to have a property called the normal subgroup property. Not every subgroup inside of a group is capable of being built upon to discover the larger structure. But the normal subgroups are. We're going to think of them as not just a brick in my wall that makes my group, but we want the, those bricks to be the cornerstone, the building blocks, the things on which the larger group are actually built. So what's that going to take? That's the first question we need to answer. What kinds of subgroups get to play this kind of role? And then secondly, for those that do, how do we determine the structure of this group of cosets that we call the factor group? In this example, it's this group over here on the side, the factor group. And so we're setting up this relationship between two smaller constituent groups, the normal subgroup on the one hand, the factor group of its cosets on the other hand, and then the large group that has all of our structure in the middle as the product. How do I determine the factor group of a larger group given a normal subgroup that we're taking the cosets of? And then we want to talk about this internal times table structure. Under what circumstances are we going to be able to say that a group can form its own times table, that we can identify uh, a subgroup, possibly two subgroups, uh, it, that we can line up in such a way that every element uh, in the row and the column of the elements in, that, uh, in those subgroups can be written as a product. When we can do this, we say that my group is an internal direct product of those two subgroups. And finally, we want to understand what we've gained out of this process. By learning how to break apart groups along their normal subgroups, how to undo a product via a normal subgroup, we then are going to be able to classify what are all possible finite groups in the world whose order is the square of a prime number. So we'll be able to classify all groups of prime squared order at the end of this series of videos. So first things first. Our first step is to understand the circumstances under which a subgroup of my group can serve as a building block for the larger group in a way that makes its cosets into a group themselves. Those are called the normal subgroups, and it's what we're going to define as the most important thing this week in our next video.